stop here, and it's my great pleasure, finally, we think we're going to have the uh, technology working, to introduce the seminar today, which is about um, titles when consumer choice trumps science, what next for folic acid fortification in New Zealand. And we've got three speakers uh, today, and I'm going to hand over to, those, to, to them in a moment, because I think they've got clear ideas how they want to run this. So we've got Dr. Andrew Marshall here, um, who's development and general paediatrician, of the Pupatero Child Development Team and clinical leader in paediatrics Wellington Hospital. Um, and he's chair of the, the Child Development Special Interest Group of the Paediatric Society of New Zealand. And he's going to be starting us off um, about this topic of uh, folic acid and spina bifida. Um, then um, Brendan, sorry, no, Barry, Barry Borman is Associate Professor Barry Borman, who we're very pleased to welcome here again. Uh, who's Associate Director of the Centre for Public Health and also Director of the New Zealand Birth Defects Registry, and he's got, got a long um, history of, of uh, research and um, scholarship around um, neural tube defects and folic acid fortification. And then Brendan, Mr. Brendan Bokett, who's a paediatric surgeon at Wellington Children's Hospital, um, and he focuses on neurology, neonatal and laparoscopic surgery, um, and has recently published a very fine cost analysis of um, Spina bifida, which I really recommend everyone to have a, have a look at. It's, uh, it makes very interesting reading. So, if I could hand over to Andrew, and uh, thank you everyone for coming, and uh, looking forward to the seminar. Thank you. So, welcome everybody. So, what I'd like to do is um, set the scene uh, effectively, um, and then uh, and uh, set the scene uh, in terms of the history and the processes that have happened. And then um, Barry will look at, at more detail at the kind of the epidemiology, the evidence for the effectiveness of folate fortification to reduce neural tube defects, where we're at in terms of the New Zealand data, and, and what's the projected uh, uh, um, benefits, and uh, what are the what would have been the projected benefits had we uh, done something different. <coughs> So, and, uh, and uh, I didn't write this, but I thought Amanda's uh, 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 poster uh, summarised it beautifully that despite strong scientific evidence and in contrast to New Ze uh, Australia and I would add 64 other countries, uh, New Zealand's rejected mandatory folic acid fortification of bread to prevent neural tube defects. And so we'll have a, have a look at, at that where did the public health message and, and the process, why, why did it end up in this way? Um, now, that's interesting. I would have thought clicking. Oh, yes, I just need to be. And so we've been introduced, so that's great. So neurotube defects um, refers to spina bifida and uh, meningomalacele and uh, anencephaly, so a failure of the, uh, the closure of the neural tube during early fetal development. And what we've known is from the 80s, we've known that a number of uh, neural tube defects are preventable, and preventable through the mother having uh, sufficient blood levels of uh, folic acid or folate um, prior to conception. And so, uh, and that's been proven both with women who uh, ingest uh, a tablet form of folic acid to increase their um, blood folate, and we also know pretty robust evidence from around the world uh, that it's very effective uh, on a population scale. So mandatory uh, increases population, and there's very good evidence from the States and other places, that um, uh, mandatory insertion of folic acid into a, a common food source, flour, usually in some places it's noodles in some of the Asian countries, whatever, um, a staple in the diet, uh, it in increases your blood folate level throughout the population, and that actually allows you to decrease uh, the amount of neural tube defect to the same extent as you would have got if the mother had taken preconceptual folic acid tablets, so that you can get down to that basal rate. You cannot prevent all cases. There's spi e effectively uh, folate responsive spina bifida and folate unresponsive spina bifida. So you never eliminate spina bifida and carefully, but you substantially reduce the rate. So the efficacy is known, and the efficacy of the public health approach is also known, and these meta-analyses demonstrate that beautifully, and, and, and there's, there's no doubt, there's no controversy about the science, 
in terms of the ability to reduce neural tube defects. So that's not at all controversial, and that's just a demonstration of, of the process of a neural tube defect. So the, the benefits clearly reduction to neural tube defects. So financial costs to the health system, Brendan's going to discuss in his very good paper. Um, and also, of course, the huge financial and emotional cost to the families. Um, you know, any health system costs are doubled in terms of the educational and, uh, and uh, the um, social services costs. And then there's the, co the lost income of the family. It's very likely that uh, in a family with a child with spina bifida that at least one parent will have to be a full-time um, parent at home won't be able to earn an income because there'll be such frequent urinary tract infections and hospitalizations and operations. So there's that financial cost to the family, the lost opportunity for the family, and the huge burden of the disease in, in terms of the pain, uh, the disability, the ongoing hospitalizations, the disruption. Um, so that's what we seek to prevent. So the, there are also additional benefits. Um, and the interesting thing is that um, Folate's a good thing, and we know it's an essential, it's, it's, a, it's a vitamin, we need it, if we don't have it we do badly, actually if you're folate deficient it increases your risk of cancer, so, so you need adequate folate levels to prevent cancer, um, I'll tell you a little caveat about that later, um, but as well as preventing neural tube defects, we know that it reduces the incidence of some congenital heart defects, and just some modelling and, uh, uh, you know, the numbers are, it's hard to model it accurately, but probably at least 20 babies probably a year if we had mandatory fortification. There's evidence in the adult population, it's not just about kids, actually, there's pretty good evidence from the states around a reduction in stroke deaths. And so I've extrapolated the, um, the American figures uh, per 314 million in their population and just made the same calculation in New Zealand. So that's where I came up with 164 stroke deaths. But um, we know that it does that. It was thought that folic acid, increased folate blood levels would prevent cardiovascular disease. Um, and in fact that turned out in the big studies that have been done probably not to be the case. So it doesn't seem to prevent heart attacks, but it does seem to have an effect on strokes. And of course the benefits would be to align New Zealand policy and practice with Australia. And of course we signed a joint food standards agreement uh, in 2007 uh, aligning our food standards. So New Zealand is at variance with that food standard um, uh, agreement. So what about the safety? Because safety has actually in this debate both in 2009 and again in 2012, read its headers as, as a, a thing to capture public imagination and, and to prevent uh, mandatory fortification. But actually the safety is, is pretty well established and in fact it's not safety uh, on safety grounds that, that the mandatory hasn't gone ahead. Um, so um, failure to prevent something that's preventable where the means of prevention is simple inexpensive and safe is a failure of public duty and a quantifiable harm. So, so, so we need to be clear that there is a quantifiable harm in not doing mandatory fortification. Well, it's a natural vitamin. Now, there's some, been some ar argument uh, uh, it, around the 2012 um, David Smith, who I did a television debate um, with, is saying, well, folic um, folic acid is not the same as folate. Yes, it's converted to the body in folate, but it's a chemical. And, uh, you know, I, th I think that, yes, that's strictly speaking true, but in, in essence, uh, we're talking about you just can't deliver folate in a tablet. You have to deliver folic acid that's converted to, uh, to folate in the body. And we know that many people have a diet that's deficient in, in uh, folic acid, and if you are deficient, there are health consequences of being deficient and health consequences for yourself. Um, fortification puts back the natural folic acid, and you could argue that that is putting back the natural product that's been um, stripped through excessive food processing and by poor food choices. So we're not really putting in a foreign chemical, we're just replacing what should be there in our diets anyway. Um, it's, and if we all let uh, you know, a lot of silver beet, then we'd be just, we wouldn't be having this. But, but not everybody eats 
uh, a kilogram of sil silver beet each week. And so because we don't, we need to think of other vehicles of getting um, folic acid into our cells. It is safe. There is no increased cancer risk. Now, this is the cancer risk, and, and David Smith, eminent researcher, uh, uh, you know, has come up with a calculation and, uh, of 1,000 extra cancer deaths with um, mandatory, and there are a lot of reasons why I think that that calculation is, is deeply flawed and deeply um, biased. Um, but um, those, that calculation is based on studies where they have used high-dose um, folic acid supplementation, like the, the, the big study. So Clark and et al. and Wein et al. are both meta-analyses looking at, at similar populations. So big studies looking at can we reduce cardiovascular risk if we give you high-dose fortification. And what those showed is, as I said, they suggested um, decreasing stroke deaths, they suggested no effect on cardiovascular risk, um, and they uh, did not show a statistically significant increase in prostate cancer, okay? But there was a suggestion of a trend, okay? So we're looking at 38,000, a suggestion of a trend of increased detection of prostate cancer, not of prostate cancer deaths. And those of you who know a bit about prostate cancer, I'm a pediatrician, so I don't know a lot about it, um, uh, know that, that even the prostate cancer, the, 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 the identifying it versus the death rate is, is, a, is again, a, a tricky issue. So, but what about actually, ah, that's interesting, okay, um, where's it gone? This is what I was looking for, so uh, how, somehow it's in the wrong place. So this is stuff, so if you want to actually look at real data, look at the US, uh, so this is the US Cancer Registry, so how many, uh, so like millions, millions of people go into this Cancer Registry each year. And what we've seen is that overall there is a reduction. And since mandatory came in in the States, so that's the period 2003 to 2007, which is compared to the whole period, what we know is there has been no, even with prostate, no statistically significant, overall a decrease, and that's better treatment and better detection, but no increase. Um, so this is the pretty robust, everybody in the States gets onto this. It's a really, really robust cancer um, database. And so that's where we can have pretty good confidence that actually um, mandatory does not uh, result in cancer deaths. So what are the additional costs? What are the costs of, of mandatory? Well there are financial costs to the baking industry but if, and, it, and if it's a big baking plant the costs are pretty mild, let's say half a cent a loaf. The baking industry believes that if you, if you put folate in it will turn off Vast tracts of the population won't buy bread because it's got folate in it. And, and, and they've done some... But if you, if you introduce the sense that it's going to give you cancer, and if you introduce that and then you, and then you ask the question in that way and then ask if people want it, they'll say no. But we know um, a lot of us eat cereals. I eat uh, you know, just right for breakfast. It's got folate in it. And so, in fact... The, the really good stuff that's happened in the last couple of years is not through the mandatory, uh, not through the voluntary uh, it, it, um, addition in bread. It's about the fact that we're eating uh, more folate, um, more folic acid through breakfast cereals. So we know, and that hasn't put people off eating breakfast cereals. And I think that that's pretty weak evidence that actually it would put people off eating bread if it had um, folic acid. And remember, we're not, you know, there are so many different preservatives and additives in the foods that we eat anyway. This is, compared to those, a natural essential vitamin. And there are technical issues with the small bakeries, you know, the, the, um, uh, compared to the large ones, it may be slightly harder. And there's some compliance and monitoring costs. So just going over the process, because I don't want to hog the floor, um, research evidence showed an expert advice, extensive public consultation led to the government the Labor government in 2007 to agree to fortify flour, sorry, no bread, that's a mistake, to fortify bread with folic acid, unlike other places that fortify flour, and actually flour would be easier, but there was a reason why New Zealand went with bread. Safe and effective way of reducing neurotube defects. New Zealand signed this mandatory fortification of bread with folic acid food stand in 2007 as a joint agreement with Australia, and it was planned to, to start in 2009. At the 11th hour, the baking industry um, raised objections about this, and the government responded by introducing a voluntary scheme. 
the food stat, food folic acid working group um, was set up, and and I was and, and Barry have been members of that, um, and um, and also and that group commissioned research and the, uh, commissioned research from Professor Skeef and Dunedin, really good research looking at does has has um, voluntary uh, in the food supply helped, and what it shows is that. It probably has helped a little bit, but as I say, probably more breakfast cereals than breads. And we know that in this study, um, there were only um, only 93% 90, uh, of women ate bread that week, but only 18% had eaten brands known to be fortified. And the maximum that we got to was about 25% of brands that were fortified. So there wasn't a lot during the voluntary regime, but we do know that between that time, probably due to breakfast cereals predominantly, um, the the appropriate blood levels, there's kind of a blood level of um, 906 nanomoles per litre that we know confers you the lowest risk of having a baby with spina bifida, okay? So that's the magic number. And we increased the population between 2008 and 2011 from 26% of childbearing age women to 59%. So, so in that period of voluntary, there were effects on the population in terms of a raise in, in blood level. And so got kind of halfway there, but the issue is, could we get the whole way there? What we know in the States, again, really good evidence, because uh, there was a thing about 11 slices and you need 11 slices. Three slices of bread a day in the States on average, so that amount of folic acid increase lifted the population to the point at which the population <coughs> had that minimum rate of neural tube defects. So we lifted the whole population to a point where you couldn't prevent any more. So that's where it doesn't take a lot of bread. And a voluntary regime was unlikely to yield the full benefits that a mandatory regime would deliver. Um, so the Pediatric Society position, as, as with uh, many organisations, uh, said that we would favour mandatory. Um, so there were option papers to the government, public submissions, um, this one paper commissioned by the baking industry from uh, Professor Smith and Refsom in England that said 1,000 a, a extra cancers a year. As I say, very dodgy calculation, I can tell you, I, but I don't want to take up time. Um, and, and effectively, if very effective lobbying from the baking industry. And, and, and let's be frank, the, the, the decision that was taken... Well, my personal opinion, it's not the position of the Paediatric Society, my personal opinion is that the, the decision was largely taken on the basis of the, of, of the baking industry request to the government, but that's a personal opinion, um, having been through the process and seeing the inside workings of things. Um, that the Minister revoked the food standard um, and established a voluntary regime where the bakers say that they will attempt to get up to 50%. Um, of, large, of the la three large companies that account for like 95% of total bread uh, consumption may be fortified. So that's the, uh, so yes, so, so why did it go wrong? Well, there's the primacy of industry and business needs over, over population health and science actually are not important in terms of um, public health decision making. Um, there there uh, was a very effective lobbyist in the inner sanctum and the political right, of course, is opposed to any, any uh, 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 man, man, mandated measures. But I liken it to seatbelts. You know, we say that we're going to make seatbelts mandatory because we know that that saves lives. This is the same kind of thing. But, but the political right rejects any sense of restriction on personal autonomy. And that's a, a particular, particular point of view. And, of course, the doctrine of individual rather than collective responsibility certainly has little interest in society's res um, responsibilities to the disabled. Or to, and effectively, this, although we're targeting the population, what we're really targeting is we're not targeting white middle class and uh, uh, um, intelligent mothers who have read all about folate and start it before they plan their pregnancy. We're targeting people who don't plan their pregnancy, which is 50% of the population, and, and people who uh, aren't uh, motivated to find out what they should do prior to getting pregnant. So, and we're targeting lower socioeconomic groups and minority groups. And so that's, that targeting doesn't sit with, with the right uh, uh, political views. Um, 
And even within the left, there was some uh, factions within the environmental movement that don't want any additives in food at all, because this is a natural vitamin. So, you know, I, I find that difficult. And, and the government's risk-averse due to public bash, backlash. So, but our point was that if you reassure the population, you show them the science and evidence, and it was really quite robust, then you could uh, get there. So that's my talk. We're not going to take questions now, because uh, Barry's now going to come and talk a little bit more. Well, as an epidemiologist, thank you for the invite. As an epidemiologist, obviously, uh, and a scientist, we have to be a little bit careful now. If I say the wrong thing with no risk, low risk, I could end up uh, in jail like the, um, like the <laughs> folks in um, Italy. Uh, but that's not my intention today. Uh, I want to just follow up a little bit with, and fill in some of the background to this. And I've over the years that I've been involved in it, uh, I've used various names for this talk, and the current one is Good Science, Bad Policy, simply because recently I came across a book to do with environmental epidemiology, and it was actually titled that, and I've been looking for something, you know, you always look for a catchy title when you have a, a presentation, and that was as good as I could get at the moment. But I think also what's important is, to follow up on what Andrew has just said, I actually think there's a lot of folly going on in the whole deal of this thing over the years. And I just want to take you back. And we all know it's September the 11th, 2001, and I think that's etched in our brains, what happened then. And just think what the response was to that. And remember, there was about 3,000 Americans killed. And we did enacted a whole range of things to protect people from terrorism and planes flying into buildings. And the Americans, quite naturally, overblew it all, I think you'd agree. And they decided that all the terrorists were actually going to come into the country Anyone who's been to America recently thinks, in fact, the terrorists are actually in the country, they're not trying, and probably want to get out. <laughs> but you'll see that the Americans did a whole host of things in reaction to a bunch of jetliners flying into the... Uh... And I think probably the most salutary thing is that Bush's approval rating went up 90%. So if you're a politician, it clearly counts for a lot if you do this kind of thing. So what happened in New Zealand? Well, New Zealand, we started, and I've been trying to find pictures of screening uh, cars going into Parliament. We banned gels, of course, and we, we actually enacted a whole bunch of terrorism acts here. How many of you knew that as response to what happened in America? But I think one of the best statistics is this last one from <laughs> Nick Wilson. He actually found that the cause to quit line actually went down. So Bush's ratings went up and the quit line calls went down. Thank you for that, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> but I actually think nine years earlier, as far as public health is concerned, anybody who's done epidemiology will know the John Snow story. And I think this was, in fact, one of the great occasions of public health. And I think in public health terms, this is the equivalent. The response should have been exactly the same. This guy is Bill Roper. <coughs> I had the privilege of being at this announcement. But what the CDC, who are renowned for being a very conservative organisation, and not somebody that just sort of comes out and says something, these people came out and actually made this profound recommendation that all women of childbearing age who are likely to become pregnant should actually consume folic acid. And you actually think, an august body like the Ministry of Health coming out, and we've got some Ministry of Health people here today, imagine if they came out and said something like that. My hunch is all hell Blake Roos, but nonetheless, that's what had happened. <coughs> Godfrey Oakley, who I'll come up and mention a few times, a great character, he actually said it's one of the most exciting medical findings in the last 20th century. And it's equivalent to rubella and a number of other things. So here we were, we're actually making a profound statement in public health terms. And in fact, the US FDA came out and said, as a response to that, on the 1st of January 1998, all grain products in the US had to be fortified with folic acid. All grain products. No two ways about it. These are what I term as the folic acid fathers, and these are the guys, and it's great that this is a paediatric meeting in public health, because this is Dave Erickson from CDC, he's an epidemiologist. This is Godfrey Oakley, another epidemiologist. And this is Dick Smithles, who actually is a paediatrician. So it's very appropriate that we're actually talking here today. And in fact, it was Dick Smithers had this original idea when he was at Liverpool. He was looking around at some data that he had, and he wondered, 
a poor diet and defective folate mechanism metabolism might be the cause of neural tube defects. He had been collecting some data for a long time at Liverpool Birth Defects Registry, and there was some supporting evidence for this. The Dutch famine actually had a low, uh, an increased rate of um, neural tube defects during World War II. So Dick Smithles was actually the prime person. It's an interesting story. He produced this after much debate. This is the kind of data that he got. And there's an interesting history behind this, because what he wanted to do to test his theory, he wanted to set up a randomised control trial. And he wanted to separate anybody that knows epidemiology, knows how they work, and he wanted to separate some woman that had already given birth to a neural tube defective child, and he'd give them some supplements and another group he wouldn't. And you think, what a great idea. We do it in drugs. Unfortunately, the ethics committee of the hospitals refused him permission on the basis that it was unethical. If it worked, it was unethical to not give every woman the, treat, the supplement. And his argument was, how dumb, I don't know if it works or not, so how can I actually work this out? And they actually said, no, you can't do it. So he came up with a compromise, and I'll go into that a bit later. But these are the numbers that he actually got. And you'll see then that he demonstrated, for the first time really, in a population sense, that if you supplement women with a vitamin, folic acid, you'll actually decrease the risk of neural tube defects. Smithall said, yeah, let's supplement. It actually makes a difference. The colleagues, his colleagues from CDC, Oakley and Ericsson, were taken back by this, and I think a lot of it was because they hadn't thought of it first. But they actually said, nah, that's too good to be true. And they actually said, we actually think you've got a problem with your study design. Women self-selected themselves, and therefore you couldn't disentangle, disentangle the effect of the vitamin from self-selection bias. So a good idea hit the wall on two accounts. There was a guy, Lawrence, in Wales, and he decided he would do a study as well. He actually did a randomised control study. The problem with his study was, and he got taken to task by CDC again, because he had small numbers, and the worst thing was he stuffed up his analysis. <laughs> he showed a statistically significant decrease when, in fact, if you analysed it properly, there was still a decrease, but it wasn't statistically significant. And we all know as epidemiologists, if it ain't statistically significant, it ain't worth a damn. So, in this thing, he'd done the analysis wrong, but essentially had shown the same decrease. Then along came a guy called Sir Nicholas Wald, that's him there, and he, after much lobbying, said, got the MRC in the UK to do a randomised control trial. Multi-centre one, they published the results in 1991, and this is what it said. Firmly recommended for all women. Now, how many times in epidemiology do we get the privilege of working on a randomised control trial? And we always teach our students, this is the gold standard. You aspire to do that. And here it was, a randomised control trial. These are of women that had already had a child with a birth defect. And these are the numbers that he got. And you'll see there that some of them are statistically significant but they are all protective effects on folate supplementation. Andrew Seisel from Hungary actually did a follow-up study, and he showed that women who were had supplements actually had a decreased risk of the incidence for birth. And he said it shows that there is a decrease. And here, for the epidemiologist amongst you, here is the graph. These are, this is the magical number one, these are occurrence, occurrence. These are a variety of study designs, both case control, cohort, and randomised control trials. And I think you agree that as epidemiologists, we'd love to have a table like that. It shows that we're actually onto something. So that's essentially what happened. And so we have this folic acid equation. Take this before the 28 days, and the risk of that comes down. And there's no doubt, Andrew said that, there is no doubt that works. That's what it is. What was New Zealand's response to this? Well, in New Zealand Sunday Times in 1993, the 
medical officer of health in New Zealand said, there's no need for pills and potions, which is actually what the study is, eat green leafy vegetables. That'll do it. So this was the advice that was given by the then health department to women of New Zealand. <clears throat> and a bit later, we actually produced, and I was part of this, so I can either lay claim or no claim to it, um, <laughs> produced this here, and we actually shared, said to women, here, go out and take folic acid, and we've got these five milligram tablets. Well, nobody in the world even supplements five milligram tablets. Why was that picked? It was all we had in New Zealand. So we're advising women to take five milligrams of folic acid when no studies in the world had ever done it at that high. But we rectified it two, uh, two years later. We got a smaller version at 0.8. So now we had two tablets, <laughs> both of which are above what anybody else has ever got in the world. And we have a bunch of recommendations here, <coughs> and these are lifted straight. But you'll see it's eight micrograms up here, and there's a whole range of things about women should actually take folic acid. So that's our current <coughs> recommendations. So what does it mean? Well, there's two, three ways in which you can increase your intake of folate, or you have your folate. And I've got it demonstrated up there, and this is every day. If you're thinking of getting pregnant, it's not just now and then, it's every day. <laughs> ten of those, ten of these, a bunch of that, and some of that. How many of you do that? <laughs> a year. And the problem is that it's bioavailable only 50%. So that's what you've got to do. To increase your folate levels, you've got to do that every day. So it's actually not effective and it's not very efficient. And in fact, there has been stories now that completely disproved the fact that eating your way to, hit, to reducing your neural tube defect of risk is a waste of time. The other one clearly is the use of tablets, and these are the ones that have been used all the time in the trials. The issue there is that you can get them in multivitamins or you can get them in folic acid ones. And remember, the magic number is 400 micrograms. <clears throat> and we've done various ways in which we've encouraged women to take tablets. <laughs> and I like this one. <laughs> frolic before you folic, and folic before you frolic. <laughs> but these are good things. It appeals to everybody's sense of humour. <laughs> the only problem is that a lot of women don't actually respond very well. And here's a chart of sales over a period in which the recommendations from the Ministry of Health and also Public Health Commission around, and you'll see there wasn't a great upsurge of sales of folic acid following any of those promotions. So supplementation is effective, but is effective, but it's not very efficient. And the reason for that is people and health practitioners don't often know about it, surprisingly. But the other major problem is 40 to 50 percent of all pregnancies in New Zealand are unplanned, and that's the problem. So what's about the third option? Well, I've got a definition there, and Andrew's already mentioned um, the regulations that actually permit fortification. In fact, the first fortified food I found out was in 1980, a slimming formula. And we've, again, we've used lots of things. The latest miracle for preventing birth defects, one slice of bread. <laughs> Does it work? Well, here's some data from uh, the US, and it clearly shows pre-fortification, early, post, and, and here. And you'll see there has been a decline across all those ethnic groups in accord with fortification in the US. Fortification worldwide? Well, it's actually 72, I've heard now, 72 countries. Uh, this has been the big driver is the US, and you'll see here the dark ones are where it's mandatory and the light ones where it's voluntary, and these ones here are blank. And you'll see, surprisingly, the US. Europe and the UK don't have a full program. This is the data that I think Andrew was talking about, and it shows here a meta-analysis and it shows the, uh, in various countries over various times the impact of uh, fortification in various areas. So you'll see that it does actually work. Godfrey Oakley said, flour mills should be turned and renamed into birth defect prevention factories. <laughs> All factories should actually be putting that in, get good flour, bread, and you'll end up with a happy kid. So what's the situation in New Zealand? Well, here's some numbers, and I'm not going to go through them all, but you'll see this is adding carefully, which is a fatal defect, <laughs> and you'll see on that the variation through there. 
and you'll see the spina bifida ones, about 14 varies. Small numbers are small, 14, 20, sometimes 12. And if, in fact, you look at over a period of time, and the birth defects register currently has some voluntary reporting of termination of pregnancies, that's why they've just come in, and you'll see that there's about 50, 30 to 50 defects a year once we add in the terminations of pregnancy. And we often focus just on stillbirths and light births, but in fact you should actually be looking at the terminations for uh, neural tube defects as well. Okay, so we put in mandatory fortification, what impact would it be? Well, we reckon it's about 23 of these a year. And it actually makes a difference when you see some pictures. 23 of them. And the fact that we haven't had it since 1992 means that there's about 400 people, 400 babies have been born or terminated that need not have been. That's an awful lot. So, not fortifying with folic acid. Godfrey Oakley again says it's malpractice. You've got a core, you've got something you can do and it's malpractice not to do it. There's some other benefits, which Andrew has already mentioned, some other defects that are actually <coughs> derived from that. And the heart disease one. <laughs> this guy actually <laughs> thinks that it actually <laughs> saves his... But in fact, as Andrew's also pointed out, and this is a colleague of mine, John Potter, he's actually said, uh-uh, not sure about that. And this is the David Smith argument about cancer. And for anybody that's interested... There's actually a, an article, this is reproduced in the Journal of Primary Healthcare, and he's got some numbers in here. But essentially, what I'm saying is that the risks, uh, B12 masking, which is often trotted out, used to be, is not now. No choice, which resonates with the Minister of Health, it's no choice if you manage to fortify. And it's mass medication. Everybody's got to do it when they don't actually need it. <coughs> Oakley again has said, Hang on, what's the difference between this and thalidomide? <coughs> and he's come up with this ingenious way, and he actually says it's 200,000 neural tube defects a year. And look at the response we had to thalidomide. And should we not be using the same approach in New Zealand and elsewhere? Maybe it's a case of this. We've got the scientists on one side, and we've got the policy makers in the middle. We don't have the deaths down here, we have kids with neural tube defects. But maybe this is the solution to it all. Don't get pregnant. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name's Brent Boker, I'm one of the paediatric surgeons and I have quite a bit to do with the children who have spina bifida. And what I'd like to do is just take you through some of the things that they experience. Uh, in recent times there's been a lot of machines that have been e emphasised in the media that may provide a solution. This is one that John Key was involved with um, recently. Uh, it's the button. Yeah. Um, this sort of walking machine. This will never work for people with spina bifida, children with spina bifida, because their bodies are too contorted. Okay? So forget that one. Another thing that I've noticed is that most of them don't play sport, okay? So they have a type of quality to their paralysis that's much worse than traumatic paralysis, okay? So that they don't play basketball, they don't do the things that most people with paralysis can sometimes hope to do. The majority don't do that. Most of them are paralysed, of course, a few are ambulatory, um, but they don't, they don't um, go away to, to the Olympics and those sort of things, okay? Oh, shit. <laughs> right. The other thing is they're embedded into a health system that's, in my opinion, for children is pretty stuffed. Okay, this is a, a, a very impressive uh, graph um, and, and represents funding um, for education and health uh, based on OECD figures in 2003. So that's during the time of the Great Surplus, right? So during the time of the Great Surplus, the under fives in New Zealand. Um, uh, uh, receive uh, really abysmal funding in terms of OECD comparisons. So these children are going to enter a system where, where they're not valued anyway. So the role of surgery, there's no option for cure, okay? We, we, can't, we can't, most of the, these admissions that the children have are surgical, 
re we provide rehabilitation, but all we do is maintain the level of disability. We don't actually improve anything. So when the baby's born, it's at the best it's ever going to be in terms of the spine being straight, the kidney function, etc. And all the surgeries do is prevent the disability or re return it back to its, its baseline level. <coughs> And obviously that involves a lot of operations that we'll talk about. Fetal surgery without fortification, of course, that's ridiculous. So at birth, you'll be the best you're going to be. Many people are advocating procedures and there's a number of recent scientific developments um, that kind of raised hope. And this chappy here turned up at the American Academy of Pediatrics a few years ago with a technique for reimplanting somatic nerves into parasympathetic ganglia and improving bladder function. He's since been incarcerated uh, in China. So I can go into the detail about it. So, so they're, they're very much an exploited community, the spina bifida kids. It's quite frightening. So I had a look at a few of the experiences that kids in the Wellington region um, uh, encounter. And we basically just chose six sequential patients, and we could only choose six because the notes are so big that it takes hours and hours to go through them. And we looked at what, essentially, those are the things we looked at to try and get an idea of experiences and costs. The first thing we found that, on average, they were getting uh, 20 major operations by the time, uh, up to their late adolescent years. I think we went up to about 18 or 19 years. So 20 major procedures. Okay, each child. So if you can imagine the Samoan tsunami a few years ago, there were 40 children that underwent surgery in that, after that we had a team that went up from here. And if you can imagine all, half of that surgery being put into one child, you get an idea of, of, the, of the scale of trauma that these kids, kids face. And they're going to spend a long time in hospital. The average length of stay during is 177 days. Now that's just the inpatient tertiary stay. I'm not talking about secondary services, I'm not talking about all the days spent in outpatients or in the GPs. Okay, they're, they're basically permanent admissions almost. And what sort of ward do they come into? Well, in our environment they come into this ward here. This is taken early one morning in winter and neither the left or the right of the political spectrum takes child health seriously in this country. This is totally cluttered. There's no room for storage. Absolutely totally inappropriate facility. This is how we ventilate our ward in summer for these kids. We have a tube coming out through the window uh, with a, a ventilator like this. We don't even have air conditioning. As you'll be aware in this region we closed the Kenny Peru inpatient um, facility some time ago and that had to be done for safety reasons. And because the primary care health strategy, if there was one, has failed, um, and there's been no inclusion of children in redevelopment, we, we've ended up with no facility that's suitable. So it's a total disaster. In addition, the hospitals are now becoming filled with, with all, all other sorts of admissions. So if we look at what's been going on since 1998, this is uh, admission rates increases for a number of conditions, but we notice, for example, with skin disease, this is overall New Zealand rates. We can see from the, the late 19, uh, 1990s up to, to now, in recent times, how, how the skin admission rate has doubled, okay? If we go to bronchiolitis, which is even more interesting, there's been a progressive doubling of the admission rate since the mid-1990s. So not only have we got no facilities, we're, in, we're filling our hospitals up, and yet this, this simple option of, of helping uh, uh, was uh, not taken. One of the most amazing things of having a ward that's not suitable, where there's probably high rates of cross-infection, is that we now keep neonates in intensive care in this hospital up to their year of age, right? It's mind-boggling. Absolutely mind-boggling. So children with spina bifida are embedded into a system that's uh, very stressed. For me, the most important neglectful area is the non-implementation of the tertiary service reports. I could talk for ages about that. But surgery and radiology particularly affect children with spina bifida um, and the lack of outreach. Rehabilitation services, um, I, I don't want to go into too much, but I, I suspect that um, if we look at the Australian model and the type of exams that you have to sit in the service setups, um, the 
president of the Paediatric Society of New Zealand a few years ago when I asked you, I said, we're about 20 years behind, right? I've already spoken about the facilities. But the system is saturated with non-development, and one of the areas that affects us in surgery, of course, is vaccination, for example. If we look simply at chickenpox or rotavirus, we have a lot of surgical disease that comes from that that could easily be prevented if those things were vaccinated for. So I, to convince me that either the left or the right is serious about child health, it's, it's beyond not possible. And of course, we've had lots of issues in our system with privatisation of public entry assessment, which I was involved on when I was on the board. And recently this board has introduced access charging for specialist clinics, where you have to prove eligibility. And for a child to prove eligibility, it costs $32. And of course, many of them don't even know how to do it, and many of them won't do it. Um, just one example would be Nine Eye School, which uh, on the radio the other day on the Insight program, a year nine class who was coming into Te Papa, it turns out that 16 of 24 children had never been to Wellington before. So if you have to get a birth certificate to be to prove eligibility for outpatient services, something introduced in this board just a few months ago, it, it's, it's farcical. When we looked at the radiology that these children were receiving, what we found was very interesting. On average, they will get 7.5 CT scans during their childhood years, um, up to 55.67 X-rays. So you can imagine if your child had to experience that much radiology, you'd be a little bit, a little bit peeved. But that's the level of radiology burden they're getting. And of course, while there's no link with uh, folate supplementation in cancer, the spina bifida children actually have the risk of cancer because multiple CTs are actually linked to cancer. So they're actually the ones who experience the, the cancer linkage. And there's very good research on that. So we try and limit children having CTs. We, we've got good ultrasound technology for those kids who can get access to paediatric surgeons. Um, um, so, so we try and limit that, but it's not always possible. So, when I looked at the costings, my own opinion of my study is it's a joke, right? I consider what I've done to be farcical because the reality is, for chronic disability, there's good data already there with ACC and children who have, say, head injuries. And if you look at the cost of a child with a moderate to severe head injury lifetime, those figures are around $5 million. So the real purpose of doing this was to get some data out so that we could provide some influence. But the data is already there. As many of you will be aware, this is the cost, the average cost um, of tertiary care within this hospital, a very conservative cost. If I, I could speak about the methodology, but we avoided double dipping, and, and we essentially came up with a figure around about a million dollars, looking at inpatient time, operations, etc. The neonatal situation is, is very interesting because when we have a neonate, sometimes they get very complicated. And we just took one patient um, uh, uh, and the, the costs in, in terms of investigations, length of stay, I think 194 days in the neonatal unit, um, resulted in that one admission costing $678,000. The case weights for that child were a 245, so that was a loss, if you can put it in those terms. And of course we didn't take into account the obstetric costs, all the GP cost district nursing, all the other things that are just there, assuming you have access to an appropriate standard of rehabilitation. So a service specification for rehabilitation would involve the international benchmarks, which means you need that specialty to come in, inspect, uh, um, and to determine what is the specification. One of the things about the surgery for these kids is that many of them have latex allergies. So when we cancel the whole operating list to do what seems like a simple um, maybe bowel procedure, it actually takes a lot longer than normal because we have to have the theatre latex free. Um, and there are a lot of other requirements. So it's, it's actually very expensive. <coughs> When children are first born, they get the spinal defect closed and then they'll require a shunt put through very soon. And of the six patients, we had uh, four required shunts, but also the neonate, uh, so that's five. 
But on average, these are revised 3.75 times during the adolescent years. And every time a shunt's put in, their IQ goes down. And there's very good research on that. This was before, um, this is, I, I photographed this in the supermarket a couple of years ago. So at that stage, the ministry was recommending six slices of bread, but there was no follow in that loaf. One of the big problems that I found when I first arrived here was that many of the children had very poor continence outcomes. In other words, there wasn't much continence uh, service. And that was essentially due to the fact that the tertiary review hadn't been implemented for paediatric surgery because it's part of the paediatric surgery syllabus. As a paediatric surgeon, you would be fully trained in all the techniques of incontinence. So if you don't have access to that part of the tertiary service, you're not going to get it. And we ended up um, developing a technique which has now been published internationally whereby we can actually create an appendix in a child to improve bowel function, where they can do washouts and be continent. And so with the children with spina bifida, when we develop this technique, because many of them had had their appendixes removed, we, were, we, we scientifically looked at their quality of life before and after the use of this technique, particularly with, in relation to incontinence. And we were able to show that the mean quality of life scores improved almost to normal when we, when we used uh, this particular technique. But what was interesting, before we actually analysed things, we asked them, how are you doing? You know, how are you? How do you feel? And they said, oh, we're fine. But when you broke down and asked individual questions as to soiling, um, incontinence, socialisation, odour, the whole works, they scored very low. And it wasn't until they had been fixed that they realised what normal was. So they're very poor advocates for themselves. So rehabilitation medicine in New Zealand needs to begin. Okay, it hasn't even started as far as I'm concerned. It needs to actually begin. And that means we need to have the same model as they have in Australia. We have, we have specialists who sit the uh, exam, um, and we have services. We've got adult rehabilitation services, but we don't really have any for kids. This little poppet was one who made the newspaper. Um, there was a lead article in the Dominion Post about her. She developed a renal calculi and uh, unfortunately ended up losing the kidney on the left side. But her, her case really typified the, the, the problems that the, these kids face. So the science so far, what particularly worried me about the canyon that we saw before with the scientists over here and the politicians over here is what's between it. I presume Peter Gluckman's somewhere in that, in that trough. Three months after Kate Wilkinson had first revoked the implementation, I met John Key at a function fundraising for the Children's Hospital. And he, quite genuinely, when I spoke to him about it, thought you needed four to five slices of bread a day. He was genuine, and I said to him, well, exactly, that's what I thought too, prior to uh, actually researching it myself. So, so the effectiveness of the industry lobbying and the, and the false education was absolutely uh, enormous. Um, the reality was that when the... The, the standard was revoked, Kate Wilkinson had requested voluntary fortification, but it never actually occurred. So there's no reason why it will occur, okay? There's absolutely no reason why it's going to occur, in my opinion. And if, as you look at the cabinet papers, supposedly they will do it in three years, well, why three years? Why can't they do it in three months? If John Key himself, three months after the re revoking, is uneducated about it, despite having Peter Gluckman as the chief scientific advisor, there's no way education will make a difference, which was also emphasised in the cabinet papers. <coughs> First Brung's disease is a little off the topic, but when uh, paediatric surgery began in the South Island as a specialty um, properly, which was in 1996, um, 30 or 40 years behind where it should be, the mean age of diagnosis for Her Brung's went from 63 days down to 4.5. The mean time from diagnosis to definitive surgery went, went down. And these are just some of the indices that we used at the time to justify implementation. So I would think similar things would exist for rehabilitation services. Same with intersusception for those of you who are medically uh, trained. Um, the intersusception successful reduction rate went from 26% to 75%. Um, 
major changes. So, so the gaps were, were phenomenal in, in standard of care. One of the big problems these kids have is assessing care because of the costs, the lack of outreach still. We don't actually have any regional outreach operating in this region at all. None. Um, there's very poor psychological supports for most of these kids. Um, under six charging doesn't affect them too much now, but understanding the mechanism by which that was actually changed would be very important for understanding what is some of the primary problems we face in health. Things just not so good. This is the acute rheumatic fever in Wellington region, 2002-2008, the admissions or, or the diagnoses. And we can see that in 2005 we had a, a dramatic increase in case load. This is where we introduced charges at Kenny Peru, just here. One of the good things about children with spina bifida though is that they're robust. Psychologically they, they appear to be robust, they're very tough, they keep going and um, we can learn a lot and fortunately none of my patients have fallen into this absolutely mind-boggling statistic. Um, so I'm very pleased about that. Thank you. I actually, after Kate Wilkinson's decision, rang um, McDonald's to say, look, this, wouldn't this be, you know, this is a wonderful opportunity for you to perhaps use, you know, uh, enriched flour in your buns. Well, if you can imagine, I didn't get a very good reception. I just want to confirm what you found that they were saying, though, that they had discussed that very extensively with the minister in their six-week meetings, and that they... Um, I can't remember what the expression was, but it was something like they, they absolutely fully complied with all of the government regulations, and that was as far as it went. So. And I think, as I said, there's no evidence that breakfast cereal consumption has gone down, and I think what would be very telling is to look at the Australian, because uh, of course Australia brought it in in 2009 uh, by the mutual agreement, whereas we reneged on the mutual agreement, uh, mutual agreement. Um, have bread sales, actually bread sales each year slightly going down just because people eat other things rather than bread. But have they, have they gone down more in Australia than here? You would predict if people were turned off bread that there would be a sharp decline in Australia in bread consumption whereas a very gentle decline. And, and I'd really like that and I'd asked for that. Uh, but of course I won't, we won't be given that information. But my prediction is there will be no change in, in the bread consumption over Australia and New Zealand. So, I, you know, I, th I think that the argument that it will switch people off bread is, is false, except for one or two individuals, uh, but, but in terms of the population, I don't think it's going to have any impact. So I think that, that there's a lot of misinformation around why <coughs> the, the risks of, of adding folate to bread. So, so what is your so solution? Like, I mean, we, the regulatory thing has not moved. I mean, well, the solution is getting smarter with lobbying, and I think what I've learned in this whole process is that you, uh, the only way really is to have a lobbyist who is um, who is on your side and right, right, right in there. Um, uh, and you know, I I don't want to defame anybody, so I can't uh, comment too much. But you know, I'm aware just how close the relationship is between the cabinet. And, and lobbyists, and so effectively there was no, you know, I knew uh, some, some of our group were extremely upset when, when the announcement was uh, announced and, were, and, and thought there's no way this would happen. I completely expected it, you know, I fought as hard as I could. There was, I, I, I was not surprised at all because I'm just aware that, that there is no power amongst public health physicians. Um, so let's get real. There, yeah, it, there just isn't. Um, uh, you know, we have to try our best. We have to keep banging on the door, and we have to try advocacy. But ultimately, until we've got a friend who's a cabinet minister, 
um, we just won't get there. Can I just add to that? that I, <coughs> we did have a friend once, and her name was Annette King, and I remember uh, being in a meeting when this thing was going on in the must have been the early 2000s, and we were very close to getting an agreement signed that they would put the milling and baking would put folic acid in, and we had the political parties were signed up. Even Sue Kedgley had signed it, and the president or something of the <coughs> milling the bakers union said to Annette King, "We will sign it and we will do it if you indemnify us." And she looked at it and went, "What the hell is he talking about?" And he said. If we put it in and a mother has a child with a neural tube defect and sues us, you have to underwrite it. And she said no, and they walked out. Simple as that. So, yeah, and that was, what, 10 years ago, I guess. So, big power. Um, just following up on that, there's sort of an indication that traditionally the, minute the government would be advised by the Ministry of Health. That's what we have in the Ministry of Health. So, is this just a, you know, a temporary situation where the Ministry of Health is not being allowed to fulfill its normal role? Or is there a more general change in the working situation? <coughs> well, I think, I mean, the, the Ministry of Primary Industry wrote an excellent report, um, a superb report that looked at the uh, you know, risks and benefits, very well balanced, uh, you know, and so that. The advice, the official advice being given by the bureaucrats or the civil service to the government was impeccable advice. Um, it's just that um, uh, the, the situation was that, that that advice was not was the, the advice that was listened to. So, so I think that it, it is all about um, ultimately exercising political power. But uh, you know, this I, I've, I, I'm, I'm an optimistic and non-cynical person. But I, I've, I've been deeply, I have to say, I've been deeply disturbed um, by seeing how political decisions are made. Deeply disturbed. Can I just add this? I don't know whether anybody had the good fortune to see the interview that Kate Wilkinson gave on. I can't remember. It was some TV channel, and she was interviewed in our house. Did you, did you see that one? And she, she's actually got this cap, there's a caption that goes with it, and it said, we don't want to go into the scientific argument of it's good or it's bad. I simply want to go on the way in which people wrote to us. And apparently, Craig, can I, no, Craig's from, no, 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 Craig's from, but from <laughs> the submissions that went in, apparently there was about 132 of them. And according to what Kate Wilkinson said, 32 of them, 32, Six, six, whatever the number is, 68% of them, actually supported a choice. So really what she said is, if you write into me, I'll take notice of that. I'm not worried about science. don't want to do that. It's actually, and this very thing that Andrew's saying is, you know, if we had have those four fortification had it written 132, that would have been the test. Well, actually, <laughs> and in fact, of course, um, organisations, paediatric societies, societies, surgeons, there are all sorts of... Society of Gynecologists, whatever, there are huge numbers of submissions representing thousands and thousands of professionals that's balanced against the opinion. Um, and I think of the scientific, of the, uh, of the submissions that had science in them, there were, um, uh, let's say, 45 submissions that had science, 44 supported mandatory fortification, and the, the one that didn't was the one commissioned by the baking industry, which was the Smith and Resum. Paper, um, so so this there, there was un, it was unanimous apart from that particular <coughs> one, and of course it was commissioned um, uh, supporting. So the science there, there was no equivocation around the science. Can I say something at the Grand Brown when Professor Gluckman spoke? Uh, he emphasised the fact that the media and the medical profession were slow off the mark. That was what he said in response to my question about John Key's lack of knowledge about the, the level of folic required in the bread. I don't believe that's the case. I, I think that if we look at what happened in Australia when the Chief Scientific Officer was um, made aware of legislation impending in relation to Greenhouse, he went public with the fact that what this mm. government was going to do violated scientific policy. I think that the fact that Professor Gluckman hasn't taken a lead role in filling in the trough between the science and the politicians um, is going to, 
unfortunately paralyze a lot of kids in this country. Yeah, I'm, I'm not an expert on uh, folic acid or cancer, but I, mean, I, I think it's important to remember that prostate cancer is quite an important disease, and it would have been good to hear a bit more about that, because I, I know the data is from the recent meta-analysis that there was something like a 7% a, a increase in the risk of all types of cancer with the, with the randomized controlled trials of fortification, um, and that's something like 20,000 people. So I think we need to realize that it's a legitimate side to the question oh, to say, yes. What are the adverse effects of medicating the whole population? And in general, with medicine, it's better to focus your medication on the at-risk group. In this case, that would be pregnant women or women who are about to become pregnant. And there's very few medications that are completely free of side effects. And I, you know, from my profession, you know, the use of oxygen very liberally turned out to be not such a great idea after all. So I think I just want to really sound the note of caution that people are going to have legitimate questions about what is the science, what is the full scientific picture, and is there a really good way of targeting folic acid at the people who are going to benefit from the most and not the people who maybe aren't going to benefit from it? Look, I think it's a really good question. There are two components. One is, can you target? And that's where education campaigns and things. And we know that those are, have very limited efficacy. Um, uh, you know, they have some effect, but limited. In terms of the cancer, look, it is, and, and you know, reviewing in depth the literature which I had to do to try and be an advocate on, on this issue, that is the one thing that is really important. It's a really important question about is there risks. Um, and I think the US data in terms of the population risk is, is quite, is very strong, that it, it does not increase risk. Um, the, what we do learn and, and, and Smith's and Refsom's point is that, although in the population it reduces it, are there subgroups within the population where it does increase risk? And it's all about that fact that if, what we know is, if you're an elderly male Norwegian smoker and you take um, high dose folic acid supplementation, you have an increased risk of lung cancer, okay? And, and if you take high dose supplementation of folic acid and eat um, a lot of bread, you may slightly increase your risk of prostate cancer. So that th there is a cancer risk, but I think it's, ex it's it, it, overall it's a decrease. The effect is overall a decrease in all cancers, and even a decrease in prostate cancer. But there are subgroups for the, of the population where there might be a very slight increase. With high dose, the Cl Clark and Wine papers are about high dose supplementation. And effectively, high dose means one loaf of bread a day. That's the that's the content of of, a, of of the supplementation that we're talking about. So, if you're a male, uh, and you should probably not eat a whole loaf of bread a day if you've got lots of multiple other cancer risk factors. But that's yeah. So, so cancer risk is not completely zero. But for the population, you know, when you're giving a talk, it's you know. Overall, it's it's and the and the uh, American figures say overall uh, decrease risk, but it, it's it's a valid point and it's the it's the the most valid point in for me in the in the contra argument. That's right. Richard, yeah, can I just speak to that? I'm from the Cancer Society, and when the submission process first started. We developed a position statement with Cancer Council Australia because there were concerns around that, and we still came out in support of it mm. because that was exactly as you said. There were it was only a risk for people that were taking high doses in some instances, and it was mainly around colorectal cancer mm. rather than prostate cancer. Mm. Sure. One of the things I think that just following up on that that's important is that this is the folate folic acid neural tube defects is one of the few instances in public health where it's actually the science is done. It's dusted. There is no more science to be done. We know if you do this, that's going to happen. And about the cancer the cancer risk. Now, is there some, some other risk, and do we have to take account of that? If, in fact, we were out to get rid of 50% of neural tube defect births in New Zealand, we would put it in now. And, but there's another risk, and it's that balancing that public health has got, is that we've got prostate cancer, is that another risk, is that a major factor? Um, and how do you weigh that up? And I think that's the important thing, but the bit I like about it is that neural tube defects can be reduced if you take folic acid. And nobody, nobody disputes that. 
it's actually everything else goes around that, and it's almost a case of inertia. We won't do, although we have a proven cause and effect relationship over here, we can't do anything because something else might happen. It used to be B12 masking, and now it's a whole bunch of other things. <coughs> Okay, I think we better leave it there because we're well over time. So, um, so I think we have really excellent presentations today. It's been a great privilege to be here to hear them. I think it's especially bringing together the, the epidemiology, the public health, and the, and the clinical side of this. And I thank Brendan particularly for bringing home the nature of the clinical reality and the human reality of what, what this means. I think that's always important for us to bear in mind. I'd also like to thank Amanda D'Souza who put, put this together um, today. And, and as has been said, it's a joint presentation on how public health and pediatrics. We're really pleased to be able to do that. So thank you very much to all our speakers and if we could just show our appreciation.